As I said this morning, it's always good to come to the house of the Lord. I was kind of in the notion of calling a little missus here tonight to sing a song that I heard her singing in my house the other day. I believe we still got time for it if she isn't too backward. Miss Jeffries, what do you think about that? That little song that you sang over there, I come in and heard it being sung and I liked it real well and I hope I'm not embarrassing you to ask you to sing it again. Tell me his name or something like that. Is that it? I'd like to hear it again. I know you'll all enjoy it. Amen.
just love that. I love his name. You know what caused me to think that and have that little lady to sing it? She's a little school chum to my little girl, Rebecca. I was back the other morning doing something in the room and I heard that singing and I thought, well, I'll just have her to sing that at church sometime. Amen. On the road down, i have taken the children to school and I spoke to her about the singing and she said, I just raised up, so I might not say it in the same words, but she said, I raised up the other night or, and was in the bed and was thinking of that song and I got such a blessing. Well, I thought that's outstanding for a teenage girl. Talk about the Holy Spirit blessing them. Amen. Especially in this community, in this city. We need more teenage girls like that. We do. This other little girl that just sang too here a few minutes ago. I don't know her name, but enjoying those little children, little teenage girls singing. Amen. Do you know the walk that we make makes an example for others? It really is. <clears throat> an old story of some years ago in England. There was a man, he thought he would go out and have a little friendly drink at Christmas time just for fellowship. And he went out among his neighbors and he was exchanging presents and everybody would say to him, now, John, just take a drink of this and a little sip here and a little sip there. And he got really intoxicated. And on his road home, there'd come a snow of about six inches and and his little boy was following him. He couldn't pack him. He was too drunk. And he's on his road home and he happened to turn around and notice his little boy just almost wallowing in the snow. And he said, son, why are you uh, wallowing in the snow? He said, daddy, I'm trying to follow your footsteps. And he picked the little lad up in his arms and said, God, from this day on, I'll never take another drink. Amen. Somebody's going to follow your footsteps. Amen. Let's walk that straight line from the cradle to Calvary. Amen. That's the footsteps. Let's have them to walk in. Amen. Now, I know tonight is communion night, and I'll just have a short time to speak to you. In the Word. I, I love to talk about Him because He's so real to me. Amen. I was reading a little article some time ago, thinking back to the girls again. It happened out in the West. There was a, one howling, stormy night, and the winds high. And there was a, some people had a prayer meeting. And the one that led the prayer meeting was a very attractive little lady. Not thinking about the danger she would be in, but she lived kindly cat cornered across the little city. And usually on the streets there was lots of people at that time of night. When the prayer meeting closed, her songs had been to the Lord and their hearts were happy and I guess altogether they felt about like Brother Beeler did a while ago when he was testifying. Just so happy they couldn't contain the joy and just had to leave it roll out some way. After the last amen had been said, they all made their way to their homes and the little young lady picked up her coat and pulled a collar up and latched over the front of it and started down the street. And she come to find out that the cold night had run everybody into their own fireplace. And she found herself alone on the streets. And it seems to be like a danger began to haunt her. You know, I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit can warn us of things that's coming. Escape those dangers. And she had never thought of being afraid and... She just got to singing that old song, No, Never Alone. 
And as she went on across the city, it seemed like no one was uh, going to bother her. But all of a sudden, there rose that great fear again. And she happened to look standing close, and there stood a real hideous-looking man, looking right at her, holding his arms out like this, coming towards her. There's no way to get away, and it's a true story. So she could not run. He'd catch her. There was only one thing to do. She couldn't scream. The winds was blowing so hard, almost lifting her body from the street. She'd never make anyone hear, and the snow just a blinding. And there's only one thing to do. That was pray. So she began under her voice whispering a prayer to God and she said she never knew where it come from. But all of a sudden by the side of the door stood a great big dog and he had his bristles up and he walked out to her side and come on the side which the man would be on and begin growling viciously. As he passed on by the man, and as soon as the man went on down the street, the dog turned and went back and laid down in the door. Amen. God will care for his own. Amen. God, sometimes he works through even a dog or an animal Amen. or some other way to show his glory and his protection. Amen. I'm so happy that I know him. In the forgiveness of my sins and with the assurance that my sins are under the blood as I confess them daily to Him. Amen. This morning in the message I might have seemed a little choppy or a little rude. But not a very much of a text for a, a healing service. But I've... Live long enough to know this, Brother Tony. If a man will just do as he fails led to do, God taking care of the rest of it in a master way. Amen. First time it ever happened like that year. Uh, we usually give out prayer cards and stand up the people, but the Holy Spirit had me to ask how many strangers was in the building, which would cover it completely. And then he made known to them their desires and, the, and pronounced their healings and so forth. Amen. Just goes to show that obedience is better than sacrifice. Oh. Hearkening unto the, and the fats of rams. Amen. So tonight I've chosen a little scripture here for just a few moments to speak. And before we do that, let us bow our heads just a moment in prayer. Lord, Thou art God forevermore. And we thank and praise Thee for the privilege that we have of coming before Thee in the way of prayer. Knowing this first that it is promised to us that if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. And we have the assurance that you'll grant our request. And there's been so much already done tonight. That we feel that if we should just close the service and go home. We could say it has been good to be here. Amen. Yes. Do you hear these songs of Zion? Sang in the audience. Do you hear the people as they give out their voices in prayer and in meditations and in hymns. As the scripture says, making merry in your heart, singing spiritual songs. Amen. Do you hear these little teenage girls in this dark hour as it's been expressed tonight through our brother Beeler that we're living in? And to hear them sing the songs of Zion. Dear Brother Beeler's expression to you, how he appreciated you and what you had done and how that you crippled him up to let him realize. What would he do without that arm now? 
It just goes to show that we are protected by your grace and power. Let us all take heed tonight, Lord, for I believe that it's time for us to take inventory. Checking up time, for we don't know what time it's going to be checking out time. It may be later than we think. So let us consider our ways tonight and our thoughts. And we would pray that you'd speak to us for a few moments in the word. Then bless us in the communing service afterwards. As we take the broken parts of this kosher bread and wine that represents your broken body and shed blood for the remission of our sins. Our most beloved pastor tonight wasn't feeling too well. But in our telephone conversation, he has placed it up on the altar. I'm sure you'll receive it, Lord. Not further offer a prayer for him, for we love him and we need him. We pray for he and his family and for every family to cheer and for all the spoken requests tonight and the silent also. Bless us further in the meetings, for we ask it in Jesus' name, thy Son. Amen. I want to read just a little portion of scriptures here. Found in 1 Kings 19. And beginning at the ninth verse. And he came thither unto a cave. And lodged there. And behold the word of the Lord came unto him. And said unto him. What doest thou here Elijah? And he said I have been zealous. Or jealous for the Lord God of hosts. And for his children of Israel. Have forsaken thy covenant. Thrown down thine altars. And slain thy prophets. With the sword, and I, even I, alone am left, and they seek my life to take it. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great storm wind went and rent the mountain and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it. That he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? I want to take for a text for a few moments. What does thou here? Elijah had had a hard day. He had been on Mount Carmel. He had seen the glory of the Lord come down. He had prayed fire out of the heavens and, and then prayed rain down upon the earth. And under all this strain, his nerves were about broken. Oh, how I can feel for him. And here we find him first preaching to a backslidden nation of people. And to a Jezebel that wanted her way. And the people had come to a place that they had forsaken God. Forsook all of his promises and all of his commandments and no longer kept his statues and cared nothing for him. 
And Elijah, in the midst of all of it, he could not compromise. He had to stand true to his convictions. Oh, how that reflects in this day. And they had a queen there by the name of Jezebel. And she had led all the children of Israel astray with her modern, fantastic way of living. She'd cause them to commit fornications and to do evil things. If that isn't a good parallel to today. But Elijah, in the midst of it all, yet many of the children of Israel, thousands of them, had compromised. I wanted to live the modern trend of life, yet Elijah would not compromise. He told Jezebel her place and how she must do. Oh, she hated that prophet. But just the same, she wouldn't claim him, but he was her pastor. Oh, there's a lots of times they don't want to claim it. But a God-sent man to a community is a pastor of the entire community. Amen. Whether he's Baptist, Presbyterian, or who it is, God anoints his man. And he will not compromise. And the people sometimes hate him because that he stands for truth. But yet he's God's pastor for the hour. Oh, she despised him. She'd do anything she could to kill him. But yet he was true to God's principles, God's standards. Her modern parties and socials and her painting of her face and the wearing of her clothes had polluted that nation. And old Elijah wasn't easy. He told her right where she was standing. God send us some more Elijahs in this day. Yeah. I'll not compromise with sin. Somebody who will preach the truth no matter how bad it hurts. God still got servants in every community that won't compromise with the things of the world. Elijah didn't like the modern trend of things. So he stood true to God. And the showdown came. And the showdown has come again. And Elijah up on Mount Carmel. Amen. When they thought that all the days of miracles were past. And there could not be nothing else like miracles. There was one man who believed in it. Amen. And he said. Bring up all your prophets. Bring them up here on the mountain. And let's prove and see who's God. I love that scripture. Oh, if there ever was a time in a place that the true power of God ought to be made manifest is today. Let's prove what's God. If education is the way out to freedom, why don't it act? If social standings and so forth is the way out, why don't it act if paying other nations to be our buddies and we find out they turn heels against us just as soon as they can and you can't buy friendship with money. Friendship is a gift of God. If the great churches and great teachers is the way out, why don't we have more God in our communities then? Why is it we're on the constant move backwards? If the educational program and the well-trained pulpit and the well-trained choir and constantly we get further away from God all the time, then it won't work. What's science done? Science, you say, the time will come when science can do this and do that. What have they done? They brought us to a place till they're destroying the whole world. What are they doing? They're wrecking the world instead of making it better. Not long ago when Captain Al Farrar of the FBI over the juvenile parts of the United States had me in his office after I had led him to Christ down in the shooting gallery. He 
said, Brother Branham, I'm a Baptist. I hear you as a Baptist. I said, yes, sir. He said, but I haven't got that Holy Ghost that you're talking about. He said, you think it would be for me? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I'll order a nice suite somewhere in some nice hotel room. And let you and I go up there and maybe he'll come to the hotel room and fill me with his spirit. I said, you don't have, a ho- have to have a hotel suite. He said, well, where would he meet me? And I said, right here. He said he wouldn't come in this gallery, would he? A shooting gallery here? I said, he went in the belly of a whale for one. Amen. Into Amen. a fiery furnace for another. He'll meet you on any grounds that you'll meet him on. Amen. Sure. God wants to meet you. He wants to talk it over with you. He'll come to where you are. Now, Jezebel had polluted the land. And Elijah, nerves had been on a strain. And he had performed great miracles and done signs up on the hill to prove that God was still God And could answer in the way by a miracle. And what did it bring a result? A threat for his own life. What did it bring instead of a universal revival? It brought a threat to his life. Jezebel, when Ahab told her these things. She said, may the gods do to me and more too. If I don't cut his head off by this time tomorrow night. And Elijah, who was trying with a heart in him of God, trying to show the people that God was still God. And it had backfired on him. And he ran out into the wilderness when he heard it. And there he laid under the juniper tree. Trying to find consolation, he had, he had sent his servant away and left him. Now our story goes in three different places. One, Mount Carmel. The next, under the juniper tree. And the third place God meets him is in a cave. And it's very strange. Pastor here knows, and other ministers. Watch, after you Mount Carmel's, you're going to have a juniper tree. Whenever a man has a blessing and the power of God pours down and does something for you, look out, Satan's on the track. Just remember the next day, that Monday, after a good day on Sunday, it's going to be a hard thing because he's going to do everything he can to knock that confidence out of you that the Holy Spirit instilled in you the day before. So Elijah had a big day. And he's nervous anyhow. All prophets are was declared insane. Jesus Christ was declared insane. Every one of the apostles was declared insane by the public. Because their ministry was so supernatural till the people thought they were out of their minds. Everyone that lives godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecutions. You become a different person. As Brother Beeler said about his sign in the back, you become born again. You become a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. The carnal things of the world has no more hold on you. And you have no more hold on them. When you pass from death unto life. Amen. When God gets a hold of a man, the first thing he does in a church is bring it from worldliness to holiness. Amen. And he brings it from death unto life. Amen. It's born again. It's new. Its ideas are new. What we need is a revival like that today. Amen. Really is true. Oh, we've had a dip of the spirit. We've had spiritual blessings and spiritual uprises. But we don't need that no more. We need a revival of the spirit of the living God. Amen. In the hearts of the people. We don't need so much of the dips of the spirit. Our spiritual awakening. We need a revival. That's revive what we've got. Not a spiritual awakening. Sometimes that causes mixed multitudes. 
But we need a revival that will sift down, shake down. Amen. And will call out all the things. Like standing by the seashore. I was talking to some brethren over in Puerto Rico a few weeks ago. That when I seen the great sea and a great storm, the waves were higher than this tabernacle. And I said, you know what? It hasn't got one more drop of water in it than when it's perfectly calm. But what does that churning and jumping and what does it mean? It throws all the trash out of it up on the bank. That's what the church needs. It is a revival to shake from it all the worldliness. And the Amen. things of the world and bring back purity and holiness of God in Amen. the hearts of its believers. Humility. Hallelujah. One man as soon as some, they don't get a revival once in a while in their spirit. They become so carnal and so indifferent till they get self-styled, starchy, self-righteous. They read and study and that's good, but that ain't the thing we're talking about. You know more about the Word. It's good to know the Word, but it's better to know the author of the Word. See, that little something that you leave out. That's something in the heart that makes you what you are. That's the thing. I tell you, Elisha and his nerves on the edge anyhow, I always felt sorry for him. His nerves is about ready to break anyhow, and that great pound from Jezebel... Finished the stroke. Then he run. Went into the wilderness and laid under the juniper tree. Oh, that experience of the juniper tree. There's many of us find ourselves under the juniper tree. I get myself under there many times. To a place that you don't know what to do. You're flustered. Frankly, I'm right under it now. And wondering, oh God, what would you have me do? You know, people under the juniper tree is like Elijah. They like to sleep. I I preach to more tired people than anybody in the world. People so tired. They're so mentally strained until they're filling the insane institutions and the hospitals everywhere. They're one in such a nervous condition till they don't know what they do believe in what they want. They're just laying there. They don't know what to do. Oh, it's such a sad sight. Listen here, my brother. You can't drink it off. You can't shout it off. Neither can you play cards till it's dull. And you could take a thousand siestas and try to sleep it off and you can't do it. Amen. All of our little remedies, only thing it does is help the symptoms. We've got to have a cure for the disease. Amen. We got to have a, all the psychiatrists in the world cannot cure it. It only helps the symptoms. The cure is in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Not take a rest at the seashore. Not go get an anthem uh, choirs to sing anthems. That's what we're trying to do today. Sing it off. Oh, we'll make ourselves like the Joneses. And we're, we're trying to do something different. Trying to educate it out. There's only one way to do it. That's face the facts. Amen. That's right. Oh, if you're upset and frustrated, don't join church. Come to Christ. Hallelujah. That's the only remedy. Don't apply and turn a new page. Just get a new life. Christ is the answer. Amen. There he laid under the juniper tree. He didn't know what to do. His nerves was broke. He was shaking. He was crying, no doubt. And he was in a terrible condition. Many of us hit those places, especially after a Mount Carmel experience. It was asked to me the other day by someone about that. And how, what would we, what can we be done, what can be done for us? 
at that time. There's only one thing to do. Commit yourself to God. Amen. And I know that a man can overwork himself. And a man can underwork himself. A man, God knowed this man need feeding. He needed something to eat. And out of this place here where he was laying, God had to do something for him. God has to do something for every man that comes under the juniper tree or he'll go to pieces. He has to do it. If his servant's laying under the tree yonder, don't know what to do. He's carried out his commission. Elijah said, oh, Lord, let me die. I've had those feelings after I'd come out of a meeting and look like I tried and preached and begged and persuaded seen the angel of God sweep to a meeting and do signs and wonders and sit in a car on the outside and hear a crowd I wasn't in psychology. There's nothing to it. Nothing to that. That's all nonsense. Oh, then I crawl under the juniper tree. I'm like, Lord, what did you, what did you let me do it for? What can it be done? But we all hit those experiences. But the mercy of Jehovah to his servant. God knows your trials. Just know this. He knows all about it. So he comes down. and He knows his servant needs some rest. So he just puts him to sleep for a little while. While he's laying there waiting to recuperate her. Praying to die. Lord, my father's died before me. And now, take my life. I've done done enough. I've fought a good fight. I've finished the course. But there was work to be done yet. God wasn't through with his prophet. He still had work. No matter how much we cry out and think this, that, or other, nothing can take us until God is finished with us. Amen. I'm so glad to know that. Sometimes you feel like, as I did one time, put a pistol against my head to commit suicide. But I couldn't do it. I took my glove off the lead on a high voltage line where I was working, but I couldn't do it. Something still helped. It's the same God that was with Elijah. That same God today. He see me under the juniper tree. My wife and baby laying here in the grave and my daddy and my brother. Oh, I was just about gone myself. Amen. I've laid her to the juniper tree. It's hard. I got to a place I saw beside myself. I tried to make a gun shoot my brains out and it wouldn't do it. Amen. See, there's work yet to be done. Something has to be done. God wasn't finished. Amen. He'll always take care of you. Yeah. <clears throat> Poor, tired, weary servant. He saw him. He knew where he was. He knows where you're at tonight. You may be under a juniper tree. Everything gone. But remember, he knows where you're at. We don't need a whole lot of Refix it up. Like the old colored woman said down in the south. She'd had an accident. A car hit her. And it was. It hurt her pretty bad. And the, and the lawyer said. Do you want to sue for damages? She said. Lawsy mercy no honey. Said I had enough damage. I want some repair. And I think she spoke well for this community. And this church tonight. And this Hell-bound America. Amen. It ain't backslidden. It's already gone. Amen. It, ain't, it ain't on its road to hell. It's already met hell. Amen. It ain't lost, going to be lost. It's already lost. It doesn't need a sue for damages. It needs a repair. Amen. It's the truth. Yes. He knows where you are. He knows where you're laying. And he sent an angel. And the angel touched him and he went to sleep. And when he woke up, there were some corn cakes or some kind of cakes baked laying by the side of him. 
And he said, Elijah, rise up and eat. There's a grace of God to his servant. See, he's resting him. You know, Jesus said, come aside into the wilderness and let's rest a little while. Some of these guys that think you don't have to rest, we find out they burn out pretty quick too. Amen. If they don't think a rest, they find themselves wrecked up somewhere. Oh, I think that's where our brother Billy Graham is tonight. Oh. Trying to overshoot the mark. These human bodies are strong, but they need rest. Yeah. Then you can take a little rest and go somewhere and they'll criticize you. Say, I thought he was a preacher. Look at him out there on the bank fishing or something like that. But that doesn't matter. Wow. Jehovah will take care of his own. While he was laying there under the tree, wearied and upset, God quietened his nerves. He fed him. He woke him up again and fed him again and put him back to sleep. You know, I've often wondered what was in those cakes. Uh, what kind of a vitamin did he hey, get in those cakes? However, whatever there was in there, it lasted him 40 days and 40 nights. He went in the strength of those cakes. God knows tonight, I need some of them. And I'm sure that this church needs some of them. Amen. Come aside away from the world and let's rest a while. Let's talk a while. You don't have time to rest, you say. John Wesley said that one time. He said, I'm afraid to rest. I ain't got time to rest. And you find yourself broke up if you don't take these rests. Uh, and we find then that he went 40 days and nights and God located him standing or pulled back in a cave. And God wanted to attract his attention. So there was a great storm pass by. And it rent the mountains. It was so powerful till it shook the rocks. Amen. But God wasn't in the storm. It went before God did. And then there come again a great earthquake that shook the earth. But still God wasn't in the earthquake. And there come a fire. But God wasn't in the fire. And then there came a still small voice. And God was in the voice. And brother, sister, I've been back in the cave long enough and you have too to know that there's been a lot of earthquakes shaking around. A lot of noise and fusses and stews and things like that and big meetings. But where's been God out of it? That's the reason I said what I did this morning. There's got to come something deeper than a healing service. Amen. There's got to come something deeper than a gift to speak with tongues. There's got to be something deeper than a rushing mighty wind. Amen. The wind went forth, but God wasn't in it. We've had rushing mighty winds all over the country and sensations and blood in the face and in the hands. All kinds of signs, but where's God at? Elisha waited, yet he was a prophet, but he listened to it. He never went out to compare revivals with them. He never went out to get the biggest tent in the country. He never went out to go on television or so forth, as we would call it. All the great fuss in America's guilty of listening to those noises. Yeah. Oh, we love noise, but God's not in the noise. Although as honorable in things as they are, yet God isn't in noise. If that had been so when the Africans beat the tom-toms, you never heard such a noise and rhythm. God wasn't in it. And we've had rushing mighty winds. We've had all kinds of fires and earthquakes and shakings and great revivals and things like that. God wasn't in it. If it had been, it would have showed itself up. But after that, come a still small voice. Then God was in the voice. That's what I'm thinking today, friends. We people are so, are so carried away with all the noise. So America loves noise. Look at what they're doing. They turn on these old radios just as hard as they can with rock and roll and boogly woogly and all that kind of stuff. 
They've got to have it so loud it'll blast your eardrums out nearly. All the noise. All the time of the day. And in the church we beat the tambourines. We've run up and down and screamed and hollered and hooped. And had a great time like that. Nothing against it. But where was God in it? What did it do? Broke us up in little pieces called the assemblies of God. The church of God. The Pentecostal United Oneness. And all these other different little denominations. God wasn't in it. It's a forerunner of God. It's a framework. When you see so-called Christianity today, people goes to churches and, and lives these dignified lives and goes out and denies healing and denies the power of God and denies a consecrated life. Calling you fanatics. Remember, that's framework. That's, Brother Woods, I believe you call it scaffold work. It's a bogus. It's a frame that goes on the outside. God only stands on it to build the building. Go read it, God. Hallelujah. It's only a bogus frame that'll be torn down. Amen. We clapped hands and said, Glory to God, when you shout, you got it. The Methodists said that. Yeah. The Nazarenes. They found out they didn't have it. The Pentecostal said, Clap your hands and shout till you speak in tongues. You got it. But we found out we didn't have it. There's one more thing left and God take me to a cave Amen. now I can find it. Hallelujah. Let's get that still small voice. Amen. That's Amen. something that puts a cream in the life. Amen. That's something that though you speak with tongues of men and angels and have not that, you're nothing. Though you can prophesy and speak with tongues and show signs and wonders and work miracles and do great signs. But if that little still small voice isn't in there, you're nothing, says the scripture. That's what we're listening for now. We've had the thunders. We've had the fire. We've had the rushing winds and the earthquakes. But God sent us a still small voice. That's what we need. Listen, brother. We need that still small Voice, a still small voice that spoke. Jesus said you couldn't hear his voice in the street. You didn't hear him crying. He was our pattern. Look at him. He was compared his spirit like a dove, gentle. It's great things are quite things. Did you know that, friends? Listen. The sun which gives life on the earth to every living thing. And botany life, plant life, tree life, whatever more. It brings forth life, the sun does. And it can draw a million gallons of water from the earth and make less noise than we can get a bucket full out of a pump. It's big things. Quiet things are big things. Did you ever hear the world turning? Did you ever hear the planets as they pass through the orbits? Do you ever hear one? That's the big things. Did you ever hear the sunrise? Oh, we think we have to have a lot of noise. Have to have a brass band to beat. A lot of jumping up and down or we ain't got a good meeting. We think everybody has to be on top of clapping their hands and things. Uh, We think the music has to be going in a rhythm and everybody running down the aisle. We've had that. What good's it done? Where's it at? Where's it got us today? In a bunch of confusion. A bunch of denominations. Broke up. Brotherhood ruined. Certainly it has. It's been the old canker worm and palm worm and and all kinds of bugs from back there. In the beginning, Joel saw them. What the palm worm has left the canker worm eat and what the canker worm eat. The grasshopper eaten and so forth. Till we've eaten down to a stump. But the scripture says, I will restore, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. We're waiting for something. Of all the shouting, we've had enough blast and noise to, to convert the whole world. We've had enough hoorah and hollering and carrying on. To, what's it done? It hasn't built the church. It's built denominations. It's made man go out with puffed up ideas and stuffed shirts. 
I don't like that stuff. Walk out on the platform and say, Oh, look at him. He's a prince. Look how he's dressed, just polished and everything. He knows how to make his vows and so forth. That ain't what God chooses. A prophet thought that one day. He's going to anoint a servant. He said, he's the biggest of the family. He'll look right. But God refused him. Yeah. We don't have to have princes and, and so forth to stand up there like I don't know what. It ain't the clothes you wear or the eloquence you speak with. It's the something that's inside of you. That hey, voice of God. Hey, Lord. That's what it is. The prophet passed by another and said, that's not him. God's refused him. Passed and said, haven't you got another? Said, we got a little ruddy one back here on the hillside herding the sheep. This is David. The one that brought this little red-headed, freckle-faced guy across there and his little stooped in shoulders and his sheepskin wrapped around him. God said, that's him. Hey, now, all your big statues and stuff, shirts didn't go with God. You might be DDD, PhD, or double LD. You might be Bishop Pope or whatever you might be, but it takes God to make something out of nothing. Amen. As long as you can be the nothing, God's the something. Amen. As long as you can get yourself out of the way, then God can come in. But when you're so stuffed up and starchy, you got the biggest and the best, you haven't got nothing that you ought to have. Amen. That's a humble heart before God. And we know that, brethren. Hallelujah. Certainly. Sure, you never be see you hear the sunrise. You never need to hear that. Did you ever go out at night to hear the dew fall? What would we do without it? See, it don't take that. Now, I'll tell you one thing now. It's the still, it isn't the riffling waters that makes such a big noise and jumps up and down that reflects the beauty of the stars in it. It's a small pool that's deep and still that reflects the beauty of the stars. What we need tonight is that deep, rich experience. That's something down in us that it don't have to shout, yet it might. But we put all emphasis on our shouting. It might never speak with tongues, yet it might. But we put all emphasis on that. It might not attend Billy Grimm's meeting or Robert's meeting or my meeting. You don't have to. What it has to have is that depths of God's eternal love. Amen. That spirit on the inside of him. That makes you what you are. That's what I was speaking about this morning. That's what I was pulling the church across Calvary back and forth. Don't you think because that you've spoke with tongues or that you know so much about the scriptures or you read somebody's books and you know more than the other fella? He said, put a mark on those that sigh and cry for the abominations that's been in the city. Wow. Who would he mark in our cities tonight? See, it's the depths of the Spirit, not the shallowness. It's not the shell on the, on the hickering up that's good. It's the hickering up under the shell. You've got a big empty shell. you got nothing under there. What we need tonight is the depths of God's love. And when Elijah heard that still, small voice, nothing bothered him. What have you heard in all of it? You'll be going in a few days, you heard Billy Graham. you hear Old Robert. you hear others. Great man. Nothing against those men. They're God's servants. But don't listen to the noise. Hear that still, small voice. That depths of something that comes into the human heart that takes all foolishness away from you. It takes all the world away from you. It makes you hate the things of the world and love the things of God. That's the depths. That's the pool that reflects the stars of God's eternal glory. That's the thing that brings forth tears to the eyes. Brings joy unspeakable and full of glory. It makes you stand when all other things will fail you. It makes it. When the sickness comes or even death itself, it's still got the reflection of God's blessings in it. That little pool that's deep and reflects the heavens, not the riffling noise of the water. Riffling waters are not very deep. It's still waters that runs deep. May God help us tonight, friends, as we're coming to the communion table. If you remember that, no matter what outward we do, how many good things we do, you say, well, Brother Branham, 
I go to church. I try to live the best that I can. Good. There's nothing against that, brother. I have spoke with tongues, brother Branham. I have shouted in the spirit. That's good. But that's not what I'm talking about, brother. That still isn't it. That isn't what I'm speaking of. I'm talking of that still small voice. That's something rich and royal. That I used to see the old mammies when they come down this aisle here. Years ago, the tears streaming from their cheeks when one sinner boy would raise up to come to the altar. The day I make a call and see a boy come, they sit and pop their chewing gum. What's the matter? You lost the hear of that. What have you heard? What hearest thou? We're at the end time. You hear on the television and on the radio, in your magazines, in your papers, that there's going to be a whirl across this country someday. What are you listening for? To hear that all alarm your radio on all day long with all that nonsense carrying on? To hear when the bullets are going to drop or the bombs? I'm not listening to that stuff. I'm listening to your voice. They come up higher. It was well done, my good and faithful servant. What hearest thou? You know, I think that we're so interested in listening so close to all the things of the world and things like that. We can't hear that little still small voice. We hear our pastor say, just join the church. It'll be all right. We hear some of them say, just speak with tongues. It's all over. Some of them say, just shout. It's all over. You can't hear that little still small voice. That places something rich and deep in the life. Makes you what you should be. A wheat doesn't bear wheat because it's on a vine or on a stalk. A weed also is on a stalk. But it takes the life in that vine to bring forth wheat. The waters that fall on it will water both of them. They'll both rejoice in it. They'll both grow in it. Men and women can grow up shouting and praising God. Speaking in tongues and belonging to the church. Dancing in the spirit and paying tithes. Still not be in their heart. That still small voice of God's rich deep love. Though I give my body to be burned as a sacrifice. And have not love, I'm nothing. Though I give all my goods to feed the poor. I'm still nothing. I have faith to move mountains. I'm still nothing. I... I I do speak with tongues as men and angels. I'm still nothing. See, it's that still small voice that speaks down in your heart that changes every attitude, makes a nature different, and you become a new creature in Christ. What hearest thou? Depends on what you're listening for, friend. If you're listening here, not no remarks, no reflection, but if you're listening here uh, uh, of a great revival somewhere where 10,000 people are gathered... Go ahead. You're listening to the wrong thing. I'll go over and see. They say they have great crowds. That don't make a bit of difference. The racetracks have that. Everything else has that. The rock and rollers have that. I'm going over to. I'm going over for something else. If you go for anything else, but if you're listening for anything else, but that still small voice, get back in the cave. Go back under the juniper tree until we can prepare. Hold yourself quiet and wait. Let the thunders go by. Let the earthquake shake. Let the rushing winds go and the fire sweep. Whatever it will. Now think of that song. Teach me, Lord, how to wait. When hearts are aflame, let me humble my pride. Call on your name. Keep my faith renewed. My eyes on thee, let me be on this earth what you want me to be. That's what I want to do. Lay that weight upon the Lord. Shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as an eagle. You believe that? They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, how to wait. Let the thunders go by, let the fire sweep by, but let me hear that still, small voice. It says, come unto me, all yet labor and heavy laden. Come out from the juniper tree and come out of your cave. I want to veil my faith, face in his blood, walk forth and say, yes, Lord, I now believe. Let us pray.
O Lord, Creator of heavens and earth, author of everlasting life and giver of every good gift, be merciful to, to us, Lord. We now stand in need of he- hearing. Our voices, Lord, has come up. And our, we have heard so many voices. There is so much that says, come over here to this church. If you'll join our church, we have the best group in the city. The best dressed people. The mayor of the city goes to our place. And many peoples in their meetings, Lord, have governors and so forth to come out and make speeches. Oh, God, keep it from me, Lord. Hide me in the cave and let me wait, Lord. Yes. Why do I care about what the governor says? I want to hear that still, small voice of my Savior. Oh, help me to wait, Lord, and to renew my strength as I wait on you. And help this church, Lord, that they shall wait upon you and renew their faith and renew their strength. Mount up like wings of eagles. May they be listening, Lord. Not for the noise, not for the shout, but be listening for the still, small voice. Amen. Lord, in a few days I'm climbing into a cave down to wait. Oh, God, help me, Lord. Blind me and deafen my ears from the things of the world. For popularity or for fame or for any vain thing that this world could offer. Let me stay there, Lord, till I hear that still, small voice. Amen. And let your servant come forth, Lord, mounting upon the wings of an eagle. Grant it, Lord. Bless this little church. Bless our brother Neville. Take that sickness from his stomach, Lord, and cast it away from him. Put him in the harness, Lord, and let him come back here renewed. They shall renew their strength. Grant it, Lord. Forgive us of our sins. We're coming to the communion table now, Lord. You said, He that eateth and drinketh this unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Help us, Lord, to search out our souls, our hearts, and try us and see if there's any unclean thing about us. If there is, forgive us, O God, as we wait humbly upon Thee. We ask it in Jesus' name, Thy Son. Amen. Teach me, Lord, to wait down on my knees. And in your own good time, you'll answer my pleas. That's right. Teach me not to rely on what others do, but wait in prayer for an answer from you. That's what I want, an answer from heaven. I want to hear his voice, not the manager's voice. Not the mayor's voice, not the governor's voice, not the bishop's voice. I want to hear your voice, Lord. Amen. That meekness and gentleness of the Holy Spirit speaking in my heart. Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden. Yes, Lord, we're laying under a juniper tree now. We're awaiting, seeing what he will say. The Lord bless you each one now. How many wants to be remembered in prayer? Let's see you raise up your hands. And Lord, teach me to wait. Teach me. Let, let, let me forget all my pride. When others are going by with doing great things like this, let me humble my pride. Just call on your name. Teach me not to rely on what others do, but just wait in prayer for an answer from you. Like Elijah did. He waited back there. He heard the thunder. He heard the lightning. He heard the crumbling of the rocks. He heard the fire. He heard the wind. But that wasn't what he was looking for. It didn't even move the prophet. He let it pass on by. But when that still small voice, he picked up his mantle and put it over his face and went to the end of the cave. And the Lord said, go stand up on the rock. That's what I want to hear. Stand on the rock. All right. It's time now for communion. The Lord bless you. I think first before we do this, We want to offer prayer for each one in here that raised their hands, that they really wanted God to speak to them. Is there any of you here under the juniper tree tonight? Raise up your hand. Sure. Sure we are. Many of you here in the cave waiting. You've seen all these things went by. You heard the great revivals of Billy Graham, of Oral Roberts, my own, everywhere else, Tommy Osborne, Tommy Hicks, all these going by. But where is it at? 
Where is that voice? You say, I've shouted with the Jessops. I've, I've uh, danced in the spirit with the musical hearts. I've uh, all these other things. I've done all that, but where is that something, Brother Branham, that squeezes me down and puts a burden on me for lost souls till I just can't rest because of it? Now, that's the only kind that's going in. Amen. That's what the Bible said. Put a seal only on those that sigh and cry for the abominations that's done in the city. Oh, amen. oh that's where we need it, friends. Let's pray again. Lord, please, Lord. Oh, I, I might sing too much. I might preach too much. I might shout too much. I might cry too much. But I'll never pray too much. Oh, God. Search me and try me. Is this speaking a while ago about the deep pools? How they reflect the star. Put a depth of thy spirit in us, Lord. As David the prophet said, Lead me beside the still waters. Not the riffling waters. The still waters. Lead me there, Lord. Get me quiet. I'm nervous. I'm all upset. I've done everything that you told me to do as far as I know. I've crossed the nation and around the world. Preaching and crying and persuading. You've been faithful to throw out that sign of the Messiah. To show that it's you, Lord, that's doing it and not a man. I'm thankful for that. But Lord, I'm under the juniper tree tonight. I'm wondering, why don't they repent? Why can't this America see it, Lord? As sure sense is so dull, is the church so organized, so tight, and they won't cooperate, they won't do nothing but criticize. But I'm just as sure tonight as it was by Elijah under the tree, you've got 7,000 yet that hasn't bowed their knee to Balaam. You've got many saints in the earth today waiting for the coming of the Lord. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us. Try us and put us into your measuring scales. And if we see we've been found wanting, oh, Lord, cleanse us then from our sins. And make us what you would have us to be. Grant that to every individual in this church. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now it's going to be communion time. We pray that God will bless you. Now all that must go and don't want to take communion, meet here Wednesday night. I'll be meeting again. Don't forget to pray for me. I'm going to need it now. In the next few days, I'm going to need prayer. Now don't just take it lightly, but put me up on your heart and pray for me. I need your prayer. I've got decisions to make that might mean the difference of millions of souls. Something has to be done. I, I went as far as I can in my own strength. I, I got to have a vision from God for myself. Amen. You'll show me for others, but I've I got to have something for myself. I need it. Pray for me. He'll send it. If you'll just pray. Amen. Riding around today, I was looking around and I was out to your house, Brother Roy, and I didn't want to come into this car sitting out there. I owe you and Sister Slaughter a visit. And I, Media and I were riding around. I said, well, we'll get back a little later, but I got tied up and didn't get back. And going around, or riding around on the road, thinking, oh, God, something must be done. I just got to get a hold of you somewhere. The hour is pressing. The, the darkness is a settling. The end time is here, one minute before midnight. See the presence of the enemy, the shaking, the feeling, the nervous condition, the tension of their world, and not knowing it, that's your doom. Yeah. Oh my, let's mount up with wings as an eagle now, fly into the arms of him. That's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes. Now, all that wants to stay for communion, we'd be glad to have you in this time of fellowship. Uh, if you have uh, First uh, Corinthians I'll leave the 11th chapter there. I'll have you read it right now then, Brother Neville, if you will.
For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak, and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. That doesn't need any explaining. It's just this. If we eat and drink unworthily, we eat and drink damnation to our own self, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weakly and sick among you, and many are dead. When we come to take communion, every Christian should take communion. It's your duty. It's a showdown. See, Jesus said, if you don't take it, you have no part with me. See, But he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself. That is, if you're still out with the world and doing things of the world... And people see you taking communion, you're doing wrong. You're only bringing disgrace to you. And it'll only harm you. It isn't that it'll harm God, it'll harm you. And so a person should examine themselves. And before we approach this sacred moment, you ask God to search my life. And if I've done anything that's not right, forgive me for it. I I don't mean to do it. I'll make it right if He'll reveal it to me. And I'll ask the same thing for you. So when you come together, tarry one for another. Let's wait on one another and pray for one another. We want to take this communion. And if we don't do it, we have no part with him. That's what he said. First, uh, St. John, the sixth chapter. Now, let's just pray. You pray for me silently while I pray for you. Hear our prayer. This is our prayer of forgiveness, Lord. We pray forgiveness. We pray for mercy. Forgive us, Lord, as it is written in thy word. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I believe you have so many...